I am here today, I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about the evolution of Android uh, as an ecosystem, as a platform, and uh, perhaps a little bit more daunting, try and look into the future a little bit and see what Android may evolve into, um, which I think is a particularly interesting challenge, right? Android has existed for a little over five years, so the idea of trying to look ahead and say, what might it look like five years from now is, I'd say it's an interesting challenge. Um, so I think part of the reason why that's the case, why this is the, the challenge that it is, is because you know, in the world of technology, we don't really measure time the same way as a lot of people do. It's not just a simple progression of, of minutes and hours and days and years. It's, it's really about the rate at which we can increase the number of uh, integrated circuits that we can fit on a piece of silicon. So I like to think of this as uh, Moore's age, eventually. Here we go. Uh, now, Moore's age is exponential, as you can see, which makes it a little bit more difficult to sort of see what's going on. So if we put this on a logarithmic scale, it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, you know, put this into a little bit of context, my age here would be about 131,000 uh, years old. So when things are moving that quickly, when you can see that like teenage me to, uh, to adult me represents these hundreds of thousands of years of, of sort of technological progress, it makes it much more challenging to try and figure out how are things going to evolve, how are things going to change, uh, how do we look into the future. So instead I'm going to start off by going a little bit backwards. I personally, I joined Google and the world of Android back in 2008. And back then mobile was still in a very different stage. You know, smartphone technology was really very nascent. Uh, Android was brand new. Uh, a lot of people didn't know what that was. There was a lot of well-established mobile phone platforms, primarily for feature phones. Uh, smartphones were starting to come along, but hadn't really captured anyone's, well, they'd captured people's imagination, but people were still trying to figure out whether there was an ROI there. Was it worth learning these new technologies and getting on board? There were advanced uh, feature phones pretty much everywhere. Uh, smartphones had started to become a little bit more popular, um, starting to compete seriously with uh, feature phones. But people were trying to figure out, like, is this something worth learning? Should I figure out how to do smartphones? Should I even invest on uh, mobile at all? You know, desktop, the web had, had won at that point. So the, there was this serious question of whether mobile was ever going to be a thing that people were going to seriously be able to make money from and be able to have a career in. Now, as for Android, uh, back in those days, well, for the first year that I worked at Google, the first couple of years, uh, the first slide I showed at every presentation was this one, um, explaining what the heck Android was, right? Was it a phone? Was it an ecosystem? Was it a platform? What did it mean to be all of these things? You know, really having to go right back to basics and explain these, these fundamental things to folks. People genuinely didn't know, like, okay, it's a Google thing. They've, they've mentioned it. They've announced it. Are they going to continue to invest in this? Is this a thing which consumers are ever going to use? You know, is, is it worth? Uh, is it worth doing anything? Uh, in fact, a couple of years in, so by 2010, this was my bragging slide in 2010. It's like, we have thousands of developers. Like thousands have downloaded the SDK. We've got like 12 phones, 12 different phones, mind you, like in, in like a dozen countries all over the world. You know, 12,000 apps, man. Like, it's huge. It's going to be huge. Uh, now, of course, you fast forward that to today, and like over half of Google searches happen on mobile. We've got nearly one and a half billion 30-day active users on Android, which is a pretty big number. And keep in mind, this is only like five years on from 2010 when we were bragging about having like you know tens of thousands of apps at most, um, you know, and hundreds of thousands of, of of users, let alone developers. So what does this represent? I mean, it's a huge opportunity, right? And it's an opportunity which is still very much current. Uh, we're not talking about a technology which has been in place and stagnant for, for decades. It's something which has really become relevant and interesting and exciting very, very recently. So even if you're getting started today, the most experience anyone else can claim on Android is maybe seven years. And that's probably a lie. Uh, five years is probably more realistic for someone who is an early adopter right in there at the beginning, you know, a really dedicated Android person. So the most head start they have is maybe five years and there's so many opportunities still, so many areas for innovation which no one's explored yet and that's just continuing to grow. Now part of the reason why 
that head start isn't even as significant as that, is the rate at which the platform has continued to evolve, right? The Android team likes to move very, very quickly. So we did the first release in 2008, and since then there's been 11 full platform releases, which is vaguely terrifying. Uh, in 2009, uh, we released Cupcake and Donut. For those of you who, who didn't know, we like to uh, name each of the main Android releases after a tasty treat. Um, baked goods to begin with, but you'll see that that fell off the wagon pretty quickly. But uh, Cupcake and Donut in 2009, uh, and Eclair as well. Um, let's see, what did we do after that? I think we moved on to... Oops. Sorry, apologies. My slides died. I'll start again. All right. 2010, uh, we had Froyo. Uh, we also had Gingerbread. And, yeah. And uh, in 2011, we had uh, Honeycomb and Ice Cream Sandwich. Now, Ice Cream Sandwich is, represents something of kind of a landmark in, in Android. Uh, it's <coughs> the point at which tablets kind of became a big deal and, and Android properly supported tablets and phones uh, at the same time on the same platform. It's also the, um, the version of the Android platform where design finally became a thing which Google and Android really cared about. Up until then, you could design, but there was no strong direction from, from Google and for Android as to what makes a good user experience, what looks good. And it was about this time that we had a more opinionated approach and, and really it became something which you had to do. It wasn't an afterthought. You had to really make sure that your apps were, were well designed in order to really win users and to be successful. As it happens, at the moment, I think 95, maybe a little over 95% of active Android devices are running Ice Cream Sandwich and above. So that's only a few years old at this point. So everything prior to this, anyone who had that head start didn't really gain much because everything's changed like multiple times since then. Uh, next up, we had Jelly Bean, then Kit Kat. So as you can see, we've moved pretty far away from baked goods at this point, but still uh, sweet treats, which is nice. Uh, Lollipop, just a couple of years back. Um, Lollipop, and again, a, a big change for Android. Introduced the, the, the world of uh, wearables, TV, Android Auto, all of this stuff. Like Again, sort of branching out into additional form factors, new opportunities, new places where Android existed. And that's one of the big opportunities, which I'll talk a little bit about is just the way in which Android has expanded, not just in terms of where it's available, what the platforms support, but also fundamentally the platforms which it runs on, you know, the things that you can write code for. It was amazing to me when you could write code for your phone, right? And then there was tablets and now it's the things you wear, the cars you drive, the TV you're watching. Increasingly the world around us is becoming programmable. Uh, we're suddenly, as developers, as programmers in this place where we can make fundamental changes to pretty much everything we interact with, which, you know, if you think about it, is, is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous responsibility to try and find ways in which you can really improve people's lives and, and make a difference through um, our ability to, to, to modify those things. Which brings us to this year, earlier this year, uh, Android 6.0 and Marshmallow. So. A lot of changes, a lot of evolution in a relatively short period of time. And when things are moving that quickly, how do you, how do you predict the future? How can you look ahead and say, what's, what's Android going to look like in five years? I, I just kind of showed you what happened over the last seven years without going into detail on each of these platforms. But when you've got something which didn't exist seven years ago and you're looking ahead uh, five to seven years, it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of an odd thing to try and do. I mean. For example, I was pretty into computers and science fiction growing up, so I like to think I have a pretty good imagination for how things may evolve. Um, so the, but that being said, the, uh, the 1997 me, not an actor, uh, he knew things were going to change, right? Like he knew this wasn't going to be the computer setup um, that he was going to have 20 years later. Um, for a start, it wouldn't be in his parents' house, which would be nice. Uh -huh. But, who, but I don't think even he would have thought that that 17-inch monitor would get replaced by like a 22-inch LCD, which was the thickness of his thumb, or that the, uh, the two 14 four-board modems, my pride and joy, man, I could get onto the internet with, well, it wasn't even internet, I could run a BBS and have like two people online at the same time. Like a museum piece, right? Like now it's about ubiquitous broadband, Wi-Fi, like you can get online anywhere, 
without needing to have multiple phone lines. CD-ROM changer and the printer, back when you needed to like copy things to something physical or print it out in order to give it to someone or trade it with someone, like that's not a thing. I, I remember being outraged when they stopped shipping 1.4 inch floppies in, uh, in computers. It's like, well this is never going to catch on. How are you supposed to exchange stuff if you can't use a floppy disk? Um, you know, all, all of this sort of stuff, like you, you know things are going to change, but it's, it's very difficult to see just how fundamentally. You know, if I'd known that all of this stuff here and much more besides would be replaced with something that I have in my pocket, uh, I would have thought, that's pretty unrealistic. Like it's similar to the stuff we see on Star Trek, but I mean, this is long-term future. And as it happens, it's not that long. So predicting the future, fool's game. Doesn't matter, I like doing it anyway. In fact, uh, even if it's futile, five years ago, as it happens, I, I wrote a blog post predicting the future of mobile. Um, so this, again, Android, I was still telling people what it was at this point. Uh, I made a guess that augmented reality glasses and uh, gesture and speech as a viable replacement for keyboards would become kind of a big deal within, well, in 10 years. I thought that was pretty aggressive. Turns out I was wrong. It only took like five. Uh, <laughs> how, how many of you have played with cardboard? Couple, yeah, or like an Oculus Rift. Yeah, so I mean the whole virtual reality thing is a thing, right? It's like it's, it's going to be a thing which all of us are using uh, within a very short period of time. Uh, virtual keyboards, uh, virtual oh, input using voice, like people just talk to their phones. They ask them questions, ask and tell them to do things and it was weird for like a month and now people just do it. You don't even think twice. Um, so it's possible. Um, some people are better at it than others. I am mediocre at best. Uh, Tesla is awesome at it. Uh, this was his prediction in 1926, uh, for those keeping count. And he's basically predicted the smartphone. Um, everything which he describes here is something which we take for granted now. And if you think that seven years ago this wasn't necessarily particularly realistic, 10, 20 years ago it was science fiction, he managed to predict it back in the 20s. Um, so, you know, smart guy. <laughs> so what, what is it going to look like? I've talked around it enough. What are, some, what are some of the directions and some of the opportunities that I think are going to be available to us uh, via the Android platform? Well, for a start, pretty much everyone who doesn't have a phone over the next few years is going to have one um, in every country around the world. And then the phones are all going to be smartphones. The, the costs for these devices is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You can get a $50 smartphone in most countries, those price points continue to go down. People just aren't making phones that aren't smartphones. And so that represents a huge opportunity. If you imagine that every person is going to be walking around holding a handheld computer, which is continuously connected to the internet, that represents an enormous opportunity for us as developers to, to find new places to innovate and new opportunities to, to try and figure out. Suddenly, you've got a situation where the entire world is a potential consumer, a potential customer, a potential user of the things which you are building. And for us, you know, it, it kind of gives us this opportunity beyond coming up with something cool, beyond coming up with something which can make money, but to genuinely change lives, to come up with solutions to problems that can make people's lives a lot better. Um, so I think that's something which is really interesting to think about. So first big opportunity, emerging markets. I had uh, a good fortune several years ago to visit Kenya. And over there, uh, phones are a really serious business. Uh, and I don't even mean like you can find a cool place to you know, get lunch serious. It's serious as in they pay for everything with their mobile phones. Uh, the way if you're at a bar and you see someone attractive, you know, you're interested, you send them mobile phone credits so that they can call you if they're interested. Which I thought was really interesting. So suddenly you're in a situation where your phone isn't just a useful thing, like a computer that you can carry around. It's an essential part of life. It's how you pay for things. It's how you flirt. When your phone becomes such an integral part of your life, a, a kind of a strange thing happens to your perception of it. I saw a really interesting study while I was there. Uh, at the time, there was this huge surge in mobile data growth, you know, just really significant. But there wasn't a corresponding increase in the number of people who self-identified as being as, as using the internet on their phones. Like, well, how does that work? Is it just like a few people doing a lot more stuff online? It didn't seem right. So we asked around, and it's like, well, do you use the internet on your phone? No. 
well, what about like social networking and that sort of stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I use Google, I use Facebook, but I don't use the internet. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So what you can see, what's happening here is that the functionality that these apps provide have become so integral to people's lives, such just an everyday expectation of what they do, that they're not thinking about how it's powered. They're not thinking about the infrastructure that goes behind it. It's just a thing that they need. Um, so much so that you could, you could actually go to a store and get a phone which had a free Facebook or free internet, and the Facebook one was like more expensive. <laughs> It's bizarre, right? But it's, it's what do people associate? And that's our opportunity as developers, is to create things which are that fundamentally useful, so important to people, that it's more valuable to them than being able to access the internet. Because they just see it as something which is even more important than all of the other things that they could do. So again, massive opportunity for us. You, know, you look at apps like uh, Airbnb, Uber, these are fantastic solutions to what are, in many cases, kind of first world problems. So if you Think about the opportunities in emerging markets where the infrastructure doesn't exist. You know, we build apps in a lot of the case to get around infrastructure which is failing to scale to our needs. In many of these places, the infrastructure just doesn't exist at all. So you can really look to fulfill some basic fundamental needs using these technologies, knowing that everyone there is going to have a phone. Uh, you do need to keep in mind that the connectivity is not going to be the same, the bandwidth is not going to be the same, the phones aren't going to have the same power. But fundamentally, those building blocks, that infrastructure is there for us to be able to build on top of. So how do you build something that is more valuable than the internet? Um, really, I think it's about creating that magical experience, that thing which feels like it's too good to be true. Now, we're engineers, right? So the idea of magic is, is you know, a little uncomfortable. But I think part of the reason for that is you ask any, any programmer, like, is something possible? Can we write code to do that? The answer is always yes, right? It's just how many resources do you need? How long is it going to take? What's the priority relative to other things? You know, we have this limitless imagination for what's possible. So our role is to really build those apps and products and services which people haven't even thought of yet, that hasn't occurred to them that it can do, knowing that we can do anything, right? So. Let's find out what would people want but don't realize they want. What do they need but don't realize they need yet? Or don't realize that that problem can be solved using the, the tools and technology that we have. So that means not looking around to see what other people are doing. Um, but, or as they say in hockey, uh, don't skate to where the puck was. Uh, you want to skate to where the puck is going next, right? Look where the future is headed. Look to see the opportunities which other people haven't solved yet. And with Android, and mobile in general, it's still such a young ecosystem that those opportunities are really all around us. There's so many difficult problems, easy problems, um, huge opportunities which are still available for us to tackle and, and dive in and, and have a lot of success with. So what, are the, what apps are people going to need? Well, we know that's all true for emerging markets, but the same is true for existing markets. Right? There's still more people with phones. We've got a new generation of people coming up who have grown up always having a smartphone through high school, even before that. The idea of not having a phone is kind of ridiculous. You know, I'm old enough that like, I remember when yuppies were the ones who had mobile phones. Right? That's not a thing now. It's like a smartphone is just a thing that everyone has. Like, um, and so again, that represents an opportunity for us to think about how are people who take their phones for granted, who can't imagine life without them, how are they going to use them? What new opportunities does that bring to us? And as well as new users, as I mentioned beforehand, we've got a growing ecosystem of devices that we can play with, right? We've got wearables, we've got TV, we've got auto. Chances are this list is not going to get smaller, it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And more and more of the world around us is transitioning to smart devices, to things which can be coded, programmed, um, you know, modified. So you know, learning those skills now around Android really gives us that opportunity to get in on the ground floor on a lot of these things, which are still on the you know, earlier side of that exponential growth. Right? So there's, everyone has a smartphone. Everyone does not yet have a wearable. Not everyone's car is running um, a programmable OS. But there's a good chance that some or all of these things are going to hit that exponential growth stage. And again, now is that great opportunity to get in ahead of the, some of those changes. Uh, another emerging trend which I think is going to be really useful to us is that of context. Um, so if I was to ask all of you now to take out your phone and unlock it, yeah, 
and then exchange it with the person next to you. No, no one quite keen enough to do that. Wise, wise. Uh, right, it'd, it'd be crazy, right? I'd rather give a stranger my home address and my vac vacation schedule than an unlocked phone. My phone knows everything about me. It knows who I am, what I'm doing. <laughs> It knows the books I read, it knows the news that I, that I watch, it, it knows all of those things. And so if you think about a device that's that personal, it gives us, again, as developers, this opportunity to create really rich, personalized, contextualized experiences. That's how we create that magic I talked about beforehand. Like, we know that our phone knows us. We should be able to take advantage of that to create these experiences which people realize can only happen because of this device. Now, of course, it's really important when you are doing anything with context not to be creepy because there's that fine line between like, wow, that's amazing, my phone knew this, to like, how did my phone know that? Why does this app know what I'm doing? Right? So you need to make sure you're always really clear with people like, how is this information getting obtained? How is it getting used? Where is it being stored? All of those sorts of things to help people really understand the context of your use of their context, if that makes sense. Uh, another big trend, I mentioned this before, is design. You can't ignore design. Uh, you shouldn't ignore design. Huge and important factor in creating not just an app that looks nice, which is important, but it's really more about creating a, a great user experience. Um, something which people delight in using, which they enjoy using, that they want to open their phone and play with your app because it's such a fun thing to do. Uh, it's a high goal, but absolutely, if you can do that, you kind of cross this barrier from a thing which people put up with or use because they have to to something that they enjoy using. Also, uh, look for opportunities to, to really insert visceral elements into your app. I, I really like this, um, this particular quote because it's this, this idea of creating something that's really engaging, um, something which is unique and delightful, something which touches multiple senses. So it's not just putting information on a screen, but it's interacting with you, it's engaging with you. You can look at it and it looks great. There's sound which makes sense. There's a tactile experience if that's appropriate. You know, all of these things can really go into creating more than just an app that solves the problem. Um, so yeah, it's about being mindful and triggering all of the sensations, particularly touch. Uh, so, a real opportunity as developers is not just keeping pace with the evolution of the platforms and the products which we're building for, but it's helping to push those boundaries, right? It's creating experiences that surprise people so that they can't imagine life without that technology, without the things that you built on top of those technologies. And at the same time, the platforms and the tools which are there to help us are going to continue to evolve. Like every year, there's going to be a new version of Android. There's going to be new hardware, new form factors. Uh, Android Studio just, just launched uh, Android 2.0 uh, last week or the week before. It's got this instant run feature which lets you do incremental build and deploy in like two seconds. This is stuff that used to take minutes. So if you imagine doing like a debug cycle, you could spend like hours a day, hit the button, wait for it to build, still broken, go back to your code over and over. And now that happens in a moment. And these sorts of innovations are still happening. So it's going to become increasingly easy for us to do what we're doing so we can concentrate on the hard problems which are figuring out which problems to solve and how to solve those problems and then writing the code should hopefully be the easy part. So as developers our opportunities are going to continue to, to grow along with all of that and our role is going to be to stop developing for the future and start helping to define what that future looks like. Uh, then, when people are asked if they use the internet on their phone, and then they will turn around and say, no, um, they're using your app. All right. Thank you. <laughs> On to the much more exciting part of the evening. I have some awesome panelists, which are going to uh, talk a little bit about Android, what it's like um, to work in the Android ecosystem. Uh, I've got a list of questions, so I'm going to ask each of them to come up, uh, take a seat, introduce yourselves, um, and uh, yeah, I'll start asking you some questions. Joy at Medium. Hi, uh, my name's Kazra. I run the mobile team over at Stack Overflow. Can I use your mic? Yes, you can. Um, hi, my name is Jen. Um, I'm an Android developer at Pandora. Um, I'm Steve Carey. I'm the uh, Android team lead over at Slack. Outstanding. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. So I have a list of, of questions which I'll ask each of you. We can just go down the line. I think we have about 45 minutes and one, two, three, four, five, six, about 10 questions. So we'll figure it out from there. I'll try and ask the most important questions first. 
Uh, so, first question. Tell us a little bit about how you got started with Android and how you got to where you are now. Okay. Yeah, let's uh, start with you. Um, I actually didn't start on Android very long ago. My previous exposure was just a little bit of dabbling and I started being a little bit more serious when Medium started our Android app development, which was less than a year ago, um, only a few months. Um, how it started was that one of the developers on the team had been on the download, kind of starting up his version of the Medium app by himself. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. I want in on that. And it was then the two of us, and then we onboarded another person, and it just kind of built up from there. So a lot of it was learning on the fly. There were little tasks that needed to be accomplished. Little tasks became, became bigger tasks, and it grew from there. So that's me. It's, it's interesting. It's actually a I found that's a really common experience. A lot of companies which are like, yeah, we're doing our thing, and someone on the side is like, we should do Android. <laughs> so they'll go home on the weekend and start hacking at something and hacking at something, and eventually they'll bring it into the boss and say, so I've kind of built this prototype. Can, can we maybe put some people on it? So it's interesting that that's still happening. <laughs> What was your experience? Cool. So uh, I actually started on Android a very long time ago. I wanted to say seven years ago, but you said I'd be lying if I said that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, my first Android phone was the Android Dev Phone 1, the ADP 1, and then the ADP 2. Uh, and I became an Android Dev because my mom told me I couldn't buy it unless I made apps for it. So that's what I did. Uh, but I was actually a web dev full time until like three years ago when I was at, a, I was at my startup. I was employee number two at the startup. And I was the back end guy, but then I started working on an Android app on my spare time. And then our CEO bought an Android phone, and then suddenly it was the only thing that mattered. So then ever since then, I just became a full time Android dev. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Uh, I started seven years ago, 2009. Um, Verizon was going to release their first Android device, so we were we needed to create the Android app. Um, so it's a, it was actually one of uh, over the first device. Uh, so that's how I jumped up into Android. It was just looking at the limited documentation and <laughs> yeah, trying to think how does Android works and kind of just going through the classes and see how everything was working under the hood. Um, yeah, so I kind of cheated a little bit because I worked at Google when, the, when Android came out. So I got a free phone and started toying around with it. Um, but I didn't really start any uh, actual development until a couple years later. Um, also at Google, I worked on uh, the mobile NFC wallet uh, way back when. Nice. Does uh, anyone in the crowd, uh, did any of you own a T-Mobile G1 or the ADP1 if you were an engineer at the time? A couple, yeah. Mine runs 4.0. I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to show me that later. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so uh, we kind of answered a little bit of this question, but um, we'll dig a little bit deeper. How did you learn Android development and which resources did you use to do so? The Google Docs now are, oh, are we still going this way? Yeah, yeah. let's keep going. Okay. Yeah. We'll um, wait until she get, had, doesn't have the mic and then we'll switch it around. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, the Google Docs now are really awesome. So whatever you need to do, just get really clever about Googling was most of my learning experience. Um, yeah, that's about it. Just a lot of Googling. Stack Overflow is great. <laughs> um, and also talking to coworkers. So a lot of one-on-one -on -one learning. Uh, so my big thing is always I never learn something new for just for learning it. I learn it because I want to make something. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I got my ADP one, the first thing I wanted to do was a app that every time I opened it, it just showed me a different joke by Mitch Hedberg. Uh, and that I started off by just following the Google Docs, following the Notepad guide, uh, and then just adding in more and more stuff until it got to the point where it kind of worked. That's great. Uh, in my case, it was we needed to do music on demand and video on demand, so. It was more about how does the network layer works, how does caching works, and just trying to figure it out about the documentation um, early, yeah, long, long time ago. Um, but also, net now going back to now, uh, how, do we, how do I learn? It's, uh, the documentation is m so much better, it's so improved. A stack overflow, it's so helpful as well, but also networking uh, and being out there in the community also helps because you can like talk to people what are they doing how are they doing it and just try to gather uh, new knowledge to yourself and practice with that yeah so i definitely use um, google and you know various resources like for searching for specific solutions and stuff like that but when i was first learning i i think i really 
needed kind of overviews of, of how stuff works and how does the complete system work, how do all these pieces fit together. Um, one of the resources I had was Reto's book, uh, Professional Android Development, I believe. Uh, so that's on my bookshelf, um, but a few other books as well. Um, I think kind of now it's definitely moved much more towards um, like blog posts, um, lots of great articles on Medium, um, <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, whereas kind of these big comprehensive books aren't aren't as common anymore. I don't think. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, one of the challenges. You know, the whole ecosystem, the platform changes so rapidly that you can certainly get a good overview of the way things work um, using you know books or older resources, but. All the things on top have moved and changed, um, and it's it's funny because these days I don't I think you could do it without Medium, without Stack Overflow, without you know Slack, with all of these things which people use to be able to communicate. I think for me the uh, the most valuable resource in learning Android and staying on top of it is actually the community. Uh, you know I've, I've always been really impressed and, and happy to be part of it because everyone's just so helpful disconcertingly so, right? It's like you can ask questions of anyone anywhere and they will help you and people build libraries and make them available to solve problems that we've all had to deal with, so yeah. Great. Um, which leads us quite uh, neatly into the next question, which is how do you stay up to date with the latest Android dev best practices and news, other than Medium? <laughs> um, hmm. So to be totally honest, a lot, not a lot of my time is keeping up to date because things will come up as they come up and I usually address them as necessary. Um, I, I do subscribe to like an Android Weekly. I don't know if everybody's in on that. Um, it's a weekly newsletter. It's, I'm not actually sure how it's compiled, but it's often just some highlights and I click into a few things that I'm interested in. So things come up. Uh, most of mine just comes from my friend shaming me. So uh, I'm in a lot of Slack communities for Android, the big one being Android Study Group and whatnot. Uh, I'm based out of New York and all of the big New York Android companies, we have our own secret little group called Android at Scale NYC. And uh, they're the types of people, anymore. well, it's not secret. We invite everyone, but it sounds more fun to say secret. Uh, but like they're the kinds of people that the first time I asked them a networking question and the response was, oh, you're not using RxJava, what's wrong with you? And I was like, okay, then I guess I should learn this thing. So yeah. Um, I mostly do it through the Slack, as he was mentioning from the Android Studio Group, there's a lot of channels, important channels over there. Um, I'm subscribed to in, in G+, I know nobody uses G+, but I, I, I do it for reading purposes. I'm subscribed for uh, Android and related Android um, channels where I get my information, and mostly blogs, and as I said before, just the community. I, um, I really like to go to meetups. Um, and just try to see what they are, the companies, what they are implementing, what are their experiences, and you get a lot of information from there. Yeah, basically a lot of the same places that everybody mentioned. Android Weekly is, a, is actually a great resource, a email newsletter, who knew? Um, uh, lots of Slack communities. Um, also, um, the Android Developers Blog, um, you know, they, they've been putting out a lot of good stuff lately. Um, anytime something new comes out with, you know, like Google Play Services or something like that, uh, they'll usually do a, a pretty good write-up and try to give you some use cases for, you know, why you'd want to inter integrate that, that thing. So, another good resource. That's great. And do you guys tend to try and keep up to date with, like, everything that's coming out? Or is it much more sort of, when you need to do a thing, you'll try and find out about the thing? Definitely more of the latter. Um, we're also because we're such a minimalist team. We only have three people, um, two and a half. Um, so it's really like we want to invest in things that actually are going to be valuable for the product right now. And so we often want to let new things kind of like be tested out a little bit um, before we dive all in. So I do the exact opposite. Uh, <laughs> my app's mostly stable, so uh, we normally add in like a new feature once every few months. But mostly what I do day to day is. Uh, because we're a big company, we have a lot of Google contacts who, from the DevRel team, will email me and they're like, hey, are you interested in adding any of these four things? I'll go through them, I'll be like, one of these sounds interesting, <laughs> and then we, we're always on the beta channel of all the APIs, so we actually find all the issues, and then other people can jump on them, yeah. Uh, in my case, I move more around about the area of opportunities that the company where I'm working uh, has, so I start, um, I try to locate what can be done better, or how can we improve this? And I focus that knowledge in looking for like what's new on, on Android. 
Yeah, there's definitely a balance between kind of um, you know the product features that you're trying to get out for your your particular app versus um, you know delighting your users with kind of the newest whiz bang thing. Even though it might be a small percentage of the users that are actually able to use it uh, immediately, especially in the case of some of like the newer features. Um, but oftentimes those are your most you know vocal and um, enthusiastic users, so you do want to please them as well. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, so looking back, what would you say is the most challenging part of learning Android? It's a big question. We're going to start from the other side to give you a chance. Yeah, you've already got the mic. I'm going to say I struggled a lot with loaders, you know. Yeah, and content providers. We're going to go ahead and just, I'll give it two things. Um, I, I'd say basically it was the biggest struggles I had were um, with the things where I had to kind of figure out uh, where the line between the Android framework was and the, the application is um, and what, you know, sometimes it's not clear what things are, are meant to be overridden or meant to be implemented by the application developer versus left to the framework to implement. So I, I guess that was probably the, the biggest challenge I had um, in my learning. For me, one class, sync adapters, but let's move on. Let's move <laughs> on on that one. Um, I it's all the same thing. So <laughs> sync adapters, content providers, and loaders are all part of the same solution. Uh, I guess the challenge that I faced a few years ago was moving from creating these layouts in the UI and then trying to think about creating custom views and how really the, the, the Android framework on the, on the UI toolkit works. So you can try to mimic that and start building your own custom views. Uh, I think that transition was uh, like a very hard but fun thing to, to learn. I really want to say content providers and <laughs> some loaders, but uh, I really wish this wasn't an Android event because I have a lot more drives about iOS that I hate. But uh, I don't know, the big thing for me has always been trying to deal with the networking and the UI at the same time. So way back in the day, your app wouldn't crash if you did networking on a main thread. Yeah. And it was a really easy way of getting around that. But <laughs> now you actually want 60 frames per second and people actually react when they do stuff. So uh, it's just been that, adding the caching layer. And then uh, we're a company of nerds, so we're all really big on optimization. So uh, just delving in with, back in the day, the Eclipse memory tool, uh, <laughs> just really difficult to learn. Interesting. Um, I think one thing that has been a continual challenge is figuring out when there actually is a like correct thing to do and when it is that you just have to hack out a solution. Like that line is always very hard for me. And on a client, like it doesn't bite you as much when you just kind of hack things out because it's like self-contained and you're like just this is a mess, but that's okay. And it feels more forgivable versus working on a server or whatever where people will hate you for it. Um, so like being correct versus getting to the right place is kind of a continual challenge. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It actually ties into the challenges that people have had with content providers and loaders. It's, it's all that trying to fix the stuff or do the stuff right that has to be done right or things just don't work. Um, particularly when it has impact on things like battery life and memory management, which uh, people are becoming more and more aware of and in emerging markets becomes absolutely critical. Okay, uh, we kind of answered this a little bit at the beginning, but we can go through and say, you know, how, how big is your team and roughly how is your team structured? So I think for this, I'm thinking more in terms of, um, you know, is the team structure sort of a conventional big company, you know, product manager, engineering lead, designers, or is it everyone does a bit of everything? Uh, Android people separate from iOS people, is there a fence? You know, that sort of thing. Our case is complicated. I don't know if I want to start. So right now our team is me and my tech lead and one person working remotely in New York. And he does everything and so we only get roughly half of him. Um, and normally the team is just us two back, back and forth. And we have designers on in Medium overall, but we don't have a dedicated Android designer. So we usually rope in whoever we need on any by case-by-case -case basis. We also don't have a dedicated product person on Android. We used to um, back when we were going up towards launch, but now it's just when something needs to happen, we rope in somebody. Um, we do have a close relationship with the iOS team, which is also uh, larger than us, but also pretty small. And we often hit the same problems, so there's a close tie there. So mine's really weird. 
Uh, <laughs> so I run the mobile team, which is the iOS team and the Android team. Uh, at our biggest, we were six people. Uh, at the smallest, which is now, it's two people. It's me, who's the tech lead slash PM, and I'm also the Android dev, and I have an <laughs> incredible human being who's my iOS dev that actually keeps me sane. Uh, my team's also entirely remote, so there's a lot of issues there. So when it was the biggest, uh, I had a dev in Berlin, I had a designer in the south of France, and then I had two devs on the west coast, and then I was in New York, so it's just not sleeping. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of it has just come from, uh, basically every dev we have at Flow is a full stack developer. So we've had people come in and move around. So a lot of my actual, like my first hire at the company left my team to go join another team, and that was like a really disheartening moment. That's just me. It, yeah, and he sits next to me now, and he seems so much happier than when he was on my team. Uh, I miss him. Uh, but it's just like, we just kind of meld and flow based on what needs exist. Gosh, here come the big numbers. Uh, we are 18 Android developers. Uh, it's almost the same quantity for iOS. Uh, don't start counting PMs and designers. We are designers, we have more than seven, I believe. Um, around and they are, they are Android and iOS. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty big mobile team. Um, but the, the fun thing is that we're kind of scattered through something that we call pillars and each pillar has like a goal for the Pandora application. Um, so in this pillar you can find a few, two, one Android, one, two iOS, uh, PM, a designer. So that environment, it it's more close, uh, it's more interactive and collab in, in collaboration, so you get to work with them more closely than these 18 Android developers, but that's usually how it is. And it's just the same agile structure that you have in, in the companies. Yeah, we have a pretty, I guess, conventional structure um, compared to, I guess, like Medium or Stack Overflow. Uh, but uh, yeah, right now we have uh, five developers. Um, we, uh, the Android team is kind of its own self-contained unit right now. Uh, we have a dedicated designer, which is amazing. Um, we, um, we interact with kind of the feature teams and feature product managers, but they, they kind of come to us and then we implement features on Android. Um, yeah, pretty pretty straightforward uh, right now. Uh, another thing, I guess, uh, since we are small enough um, at Five Developers, we're all um, kind of Android generalists or Android full stack developers, as opposed to being um, you know separated into a UI team or a you know a back end core team. And that makes uh, that's interesting to see the uh, the variations both in sort of the structure and the company size and everything else. A related question to that is, you know, what, what does the process look like outside of engineering? Like, um, you know, with other stakeholders, do the feature requests kind of follow that same pattern beforehand of like Android devs coming up with cool things to do on the weekend and then convincing product to implement it? Or does it come from CEOs who got a new phone and wants new features? Like, where does, where does it come from? How does that process work? Uh, you can start on the other side, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. So for Slack right now, we're we're still pretty early in our product lifecycle. So we're still we're still implementing you know basic product features that we think are critical to how Slack works and how Slack should work in the future. And uh, so for that reason, a lot of the the you know, our feature development on Android is driven by what types of features and what types of um, pro product things are needed um, on Slack as an entire product. Um, it's very important for Slack that all of our features work across all of our clients. So keeping um, web and iOS and Android and you know all of the all of the other clients um, at parity uh, to to make sure that people are able to communicate on equal footing basically um, is is the most important thing right now. With respect to Android um, specific features, um, those those types of features do come up from the team. Um, you know, we're the Android experts. We can kind of advocate for the cool new thing that we think our users will appreciate. Uh, well, the the company or, or the product is pretty much well structured. So uh, a lot of the features come from uh, the PMs, the stakeholders. Um, and we, we start working on them, but we also have some input about Android UX or how does the feature blends into the app, into the Android app. Um, also, another thing is that we have these hackathons where you can like come with a crazy idea uh, that you want to 
put in Pandora. And there are some uh, good ideas that have been in, in, in the Pandora app in production. So um, it's not necessarily that the idea comes from the PM. Like there's also some input that the Android developers and iOS developers can, can bring into the table. I wish I had a sane answer to this one too. Uh, <laughs> so I just got out of management camp, so I actually know the exact correct answer I'm supposed to give for this. We are a pluralist organization, which means everything comes from the bottom up. And uh, that's nice, but it's also a lot of pressure. <laughs> but uh, so basically, we just come up with ideas randomly. And uh, we don't really have a big hierarchy. Everything's really flat. So we just kind of do whatever we want. So like one of the last things I worked on was I had an idea for how to replace something that our sales team uses. And I was like, I'm just going to do it. So that's kind of how the entire company works. And uh, we actually have like different sections of the company that work on different products. But every one of those has a how to join us if you just feel like joining us. And we always have low priority bugs that are like, I have a lot of low priority Android bugs that uh, I don't feel like doing. But if anyone ever feels excited about doing, then they can do it before I get a chance to do it and whatnot. So it mostly just works. And then the idea generation is both top down and bottom up because it's just we know the needs and uses of the Android process more than anyone else does. Well, we're somewhat of a balance. Um, for me, I feel like input is coming from all directions. The CEO is hard to say no to, but that does happen. Um, I, I personally care more about the users, so often something that I'm excited to dive into is something that like our beta community is yowling about. That's what I'm going to hop on. Um, I do know that Android has a special place in, in, our, in the medium organization because we're very good at ex for experimentation. So we often use it as a place to test out a new concept because we can roll out like whenever we feel like it, which is the awesome thing about the Android platform. Um, so yeah, we often work with designers and PMs, particularly during the experimentation phase as we're trying to figure out what exactly we want this new fancy medium feature to be. That's great. Now, I, I think uh, each of your products uh, is available on uh, like Android and iOS and web as well, right? Like, How much pressure have you found to keep sort of feature parity across each of those platforms, even potentially at the uh, expense of being able to do features specific to any of those platforms? Um, yeah, I actually wanted to come back to that because I remember you mentioned parity and I was like, oh, parity. Oh. <laughs> um, so for us, we actually, from the outset, wanted to not ha have parity as a goal because unlike, unlike Slack where everybody has to talk to each other, like Medium is a more individual experience and we wanted that experience to be cohesive even over having all the features that every other platform has. So we push back against it hard even though people do complain. Uh, we have a core set of features that are, there's parity in the apps because like it's a question, question and answer website so if you can't <laughs> ask for answer question it's kind of pointless. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, platform specific things. So uh, there's a lot of really good examples. So I added a widget to our app like two years ago. Uh, it was one of the first things I worked on after we launched and everyone was like, no one really understood Android. And they were like, what is this? No one cares about this. And then everyone started using it. And I was like, ha, ah, knew it. <laughs> uh, but it's one of those things where I don't really care that much about parity as long as they're both good experiences based on their platforms. But on flip side, uh, we're a very, very, very open community. So uh, like actually, I do beta testing in the open, and everyone can see it and all that. And I know exactly in five days, we're releasing an iOS app update, which includes a really fun feature. Every winter, we give hats to Stack Overflow users. Uh, and my iOS dev did that in two days on his spare time. And I just don't have that time, nor do I have SVG parsing libraries. <laughs> so I know for the next like three weeks, people are going to tell me that I hate them, and I hate Android. But I just have to live with it. So. <laughs> So in our case, our goal is to, to give like a lean back experience um, to our users. And that, that applies to any uh, platform that we have, like web, uh, CE, uh, cars, Android, iOS, um, web, did I already say that? Uh, so we try to have the parity on all our products. But we also try to think about differentiating uh, which platform has features that cannot be done in another platform. So, so we also offer few things that will be different, uh, that will have a different experience like uh, Apple TV or watches um, that you cannot offer on other platforms. Um, but the, the, the main experience should be uh, equal across. 
Yeah, so uh, as far as kind of like all the, the core features, yeah, the parity is, is very important just so you can all communicate in the same way. But um, we, we find that, um, you know, the teams are actually kind of constantly leapfrogging each other. So, you know, we'll, we'll work on one area of the app um, and, you know, make a bunch of improvements. And, you know, we'll be, at, we'll be ahead of the iOS app in that area. And, you know, they maybe are ahead in another area. And we're constantly kind of going back and forth and trying to make the best apps that we can. Um, but it's um, yeah. I think the most important thing is that you know they're, they're, the core experience is close enough, and then yeah, the little goodies uh, here and there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that sounds nice. awesome. Um, so apart from content providers and loaders, um, <laughs> what what are the biggest challenges facing your Android team today? So what's the thing which you know when you're going into work, it's like this is going to give me a headache. This is giving me sleepless nights. <laughs> I'm not very good at these challenge questions. <laughs> um, one thing that I know we've had to overcome is, I think you'll notice in SF, not everybody has one of these. Um, a lot of your company will probably be using iOS devices, and so they won't understand when you say that this doesn't make sense in Android. Like, this design you just gave me feels very iOS-C. Um, and so that is something that we definitely had to overcome for the last few months of development, just getting people to understand us, whether it's designers or product people or even our users sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. That if this was like three years ago, that would be the bane of my existence because no matter where I was, that wasn't what was happening. Uh, and then luckily at Stack Android, we made our Android app first. And that was like the greatest day ever. <laughs> I remember in uh, 2011, I was working for a contractor for Ford, and their spec for the Android app was the spec for the iOS app was a flash video made by IDEO, and they were like, "We want pixel perfection." I'm like, I physically can't do that, <laughs> but I did not win that fight, so I tried my best anyway. Uh, my biggest thing right now is uh, Indian users are like users in India are my number two biggest pool of users because Stack Overflow is huge in India, and uh, normally they don't have the highest top of the line phones, and a lot of them actually have Android One phones, and uh, a lot of it comes out to our app seems simple, but it actually is very complex. And like I mentioned this earlier, I sp spent the better part of a year and a half trying to debug why uh, questions in the app would just show up as black screens sometimes. Ended up being a specific f uh, bug when you were doing GPU rendering on semi-transparent backgrounds on Samsung Galaxy devices. And like, that's pretty specific. Yes, uh, and I, I would say I lost a lot of hair, but I didn't have hair to begin with. But uh, that, like, that kept me up at night for a very long time. <laughs> Although well, it sounds like you weren't sleeping anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So four years ago, working on all these different players uh, for all the Android devices that Verizon used to ship, um, that was a nightmare. Uh, you have all this fragmentation, and you have you need to make uh, streaming, and you make, you need to make downloading work across all these devices. That was a big challenge for me back in the days. Uh, today, it's about facing a code base that it's five years old, uh, where you have like all these different language behavior uh, patterns and um, Android libraries change every month, almost. Uh, so right now, the challenge that we're facing is how to start adopting these new technologies and these new t libraries. And, try to morph our code and try to, to, to improve uh, performance in our application. That's a, a very big challenge that we're going to face in 2016, um, which is something that I'm very excited to see done. Uh, explaining the back button to somebody who has never used an Android device. Uh, no, so <laughs> the, the um, probably one of the biggest challenges right now is, is actually more um, on the, the same line uh, is, you know, there are all these new things coming out. So like we mentioned, somebody mentioned RxJava. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're looking at, you know, how are we going to use RxJava to, you know, replace a whole bunch of things like async tasks? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, but how do we do that in, um, in a way where, you know, there, there's a framework around it and there's a way where, you know, we have five developers. How, how can five developers come up to speed on um, a new technology like this without, you know, losing velocity and things like that? So, um, yeah, integrating kind of new technologies and kind of staying up to speed, it's actually a good problem to have. Along the same lines, um, you know, 
for those of you who have uh, more mature code bases or at least have, have worked in them, you know, do you find yourself regularly going through and sort of clearing out code for platforms which are no longer relevant? Like is there still cupcake stuff somewhere in your code base or does that get removed every year? Um, we're, so we were lucky, um, so when Slack first launched, um, we had a, uh, an app that was um, written um, and we decided to rewrite it uh, and target API 15 and above. So uh, we're still pretty fresh as far as kind of API level support goes, so we haven't had to go back and clean up yet. So in our case, we take a look at our numbers of uh, adoption for, for our users and whenever we decide that uh, we want to remove an API, we celebrate and <laughs> clean our code and, um, and continue working. Yeah. What API level are you at? Uh, we are in Jellybean, MR1. So uh, one of the actual, I, I joined the Slack team when people were already working on the Android app and it was like three months in development, but it was a team of people that were .NET devs that said, you know, a job is close enough that I can do it. And I entered and I believe my first, I was like, what the hell is going on? Uh, I feel like I should say that's my background too. <laughs> yeah, it's a, so it was a mess. That, one of the first decisions I made was I'm not letting this launch with 2.3 as the minimum SDK, so we also do API level 15. Uh, it was 14 for a long time, and then I moved it up to 15 and someone tried to get in a fight with me, and I was like, there's literally no difference. <laughs> We're gonna go to 16. Yeah, 16 I'm very excited about. Uh, so that, we haven't acted a lot. Uh, the big thing has been, uh, slowly over the last year, I've gotten, I've really drank to Rx Java Juice and going through the code base and just changing it. So right now I have three different networking libraries that all do the same thing, just depending on when I wrote that code. <laughs> uh, so just going through it, and the worst part is it's all my code. So just going through it and like deleting that is, I tried it a lot. We have challenges on every team to see how much code you can delete, so nice. works. <laughs> is that one of those, who wrote, oh, that was me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it took me a long time to learn that deleting code is actually a beautiful thing. Um, it definitely hurt the first few times, and then you figured out that, you know, that means, as corny as it is, you've learned, and that there is something better. Um, so, deleting code is great. Um, we have the opposite problem with um, versions. We had to push backwards, because we started working just in the newest one, on the newest, and then once you would push out to real users, they're like, why can't I use it? And so we actually pushed backwards a few layers. I think now we support Jelly Bean as the lowest one. Um, but yeah, so, depends on where you are, I guess. Cool. Uh, what are, oh, this is good, this is the, the reverse direction. What are some of your favorite moments in your Android development career? Apart from being able to delete code, I guess, you got that one covered. Um, yeah, you wanna start? Um, when I discovered that you didn't have to bind like the entire activity all at once, and you could split it up into kind of dedicated binders that can be reused, like, I just went binder crazy for a while. <laughs> like every single little thing must have its own binder. And um, yeah, they're just somehow, I think my best moment was when I realized that classes are a beautiful thing. And yeah. Uh, so I did Android as a hobby for a very long time while I was doing web dev. And it was always what I, it took me a very long time to realize that's where I was getting all my happiness from. So I have a lot of those. Uh, one was definitely when I started making custom views. I thought I was like a god. Uh, turns out my custom views were just linear layouts that had other stuff in them, but I got better eventually. That's not important right now. Yeah, uh, the biggest thing though definitely was uh, just like three, four weeks ago, I was walking down the street in Brooklyn and uh, I saw a car and I looked at the front of it. And I was like, that seems familiar. And I looked at the back of it and it was the car that I worked on. It was a 2011 Ford uh, Electric. And uh, I saw the person coming out of it who went to the same coffee shop and I talked to him and he had an Android phone and I was like, you're using code that I wrote like four <laughs> years ago and it's still like powering your car. And it was like the greatest moment I've ever had in a long time. Nice. Uh, in my case is when my paints and my shaders work in my canvas. Uh, because sometimes I, I'm still doing sometimes like trial and error. Um, but I, I really like when my, when my custom views are like working exactly as I want. Uh, another one is I, when I BART, uh, seeing people that are using the, the Android app or even iOS um, applications is really rewarding to see that, um, I don't know, you're, you're looking at almost 80 million people and, and, and you're, you know that your, your code or everything that you wrote um, reaches to a lot of people uh, that could be just on your left, on your right. Um, so I'd say, I, I get to do something that you don't often get to do, and that's kind of rewrite an app from the ground up. Um, usually, it'll either get to a point where it's too far gone, and you have to just work with it and refactor little by little, or you know, 
you don't you never had an app to begin with. But um, so we, we got to take a lot of the lessons learned um, by the initial uh, implementation and, and kind of create something that we thought would be a really good foundation for the future. Um, and thus far, it has been. Um, the, the nice thing about that, it, the, the way that we did it, is that all of the parts that we really messed up, we're able to replace just those parts without having to rewrite the entire app. So um, that's probably been kind of the coolest thing lately. Nice. So what are the things that you are most excited for in Android development right now? Let's start in the middle. Yeah. Whoever in the middle has the mic probably would be uh, easy. The ecosystem and connected homes, hardware, um, Android OS expanding more than smartphones and wearables, expanding to hardware. Uh, it's another, I feel like it's another type of thinking, is you're going more deeper about performance, uh, less memory to, for you to build something. Um, virtual reality, uh, how is that going to blend um, in the ecosystem for all your Android uh, hardware? Um, I'm super excited about that. And I'm super excited about Android Studio 2.0, yeah. <laughs> uh, how it will make our lives easier and faster. Uh, the new emulators, I'm super excited about that. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the new tools um, and kind of the tool ecosystem uh, is really, really impressive and kind of where that's going is, is really good. I mean, I'm remembering back to kind of like developing on Eclipse and, you know, the ADT tool and, you know, it would, you know, build your code, but that's, <laughs> that's about all you'd get. Uh, and, but now it's, um, you know, in, the integration with IntelliJ, all of the, um, the instant run stuff, um, really looking forward to all of that and just make it so when you, you know, change something and you hit a button and a couple seconds later you can actually see it something that our web developer friends have been bragging about for a long time. Um, you know, getting that's going to be really amazing. Particularly if you're building your own custom views and having trouble with the shaders. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, I'm just going to use it as a chance to talk about Akshava. Uh, it's the greatest thing on the planet. And it's really <laughs> stuff everything. No, uh, I'm real into hardware too, but most of my hardware stuff is non-Android related, even though it really should be Android related. Uh, the biggest thing, like in the last year, that I've been excited about was uh, basically com completely moving my app finally over to Gradle from Ant. It took me a very long time to understand it. The first time I ran it with Gradle, it took four and a half minutes, and the Ant build took one and a half minutes. And I like called my friends, and was like, "This can't be right." And they're like, "No, it's right. It'll get better. <laughs> it's gotten a little bit better." But uh, like one of my biggest goals off the bat was uh, I wanted the beta version of my app to have a different icon than the prod version of my app and a different bundle so I could have them both installed at the same time. And with Gradle, I have that now. And I even have like a little hard hat on the icon to show its <laughs> development build. I'm like, that filled me with glee. Legit. Yeah, it's like what the Google guys do and like it's what the Facebook people do. And like I saw them doing it and I was like, I want that and I finally have it. Uh, and then it's just also like different form factors. I, I'm wearing an Apple Watch right now, but I've been working on Android Wear for a long time. And it's like without my watch, I don't know how to go home anymore. So it just, <laughs> it's really lovely. Seems like that could be a problem. Yes. Cool. Um, I won't have to pile on to Android Studio 2.0. Really excited about that one. Um, but also, earlier you mentioned the, um, that your phone now knows a lot about yourself. But I'm actually really looking forward to when your phone knows more about you than you do. Um, <laughs> sort of self-learning, not just for like narcissistic reasons, but also for like health reasons and just like building better habits and all sorts of good stuff like that. So. I think the phone has a lot of potential in that world. It, it feels like something you carry around, like constantly. Like people have, there's, there's been studies, like people have serious anxiety if their phone is more than two meters away for longer than five minutes. It's like something's not right. Um, so we should at least harness that for good somehow. <laughs> let's see. Uh, okay, so let's talk about, well, we've kind of already started to do that, uh, talking about Android outside the phone and tablet. Um, what kind of devices and or other applications of Android are you the most interested in right now? Um, I think specifically because we touched on this already a little bit, but what, what are some of the applications that you would love to see built on top of some of these new form factors? Um, I'm actually looking really forward to when it's like 
totally normal for Andrew to just control, control your car. We were just talking about this over dinner a few nights ago with me and my nerdy friends, and we were just talking about like the security considerations and how awesome it would be to not have every single car redesign its interface because they all do basically the same thing. Um, yeah, mobile, auto. So I'm terrified now. I'm a really big paranoid human being, and now you're talking about your phone and your car and all that. So I'm like, ah. <laughs> uh, my big thing is just uh, my phone has a Bluetooth beacon. So uh, my entire home back in Brooklyn is wired up to my phone. So if my phone goes within 30 feet away from my apartment, all the lights turn off, the AC turns off. If I leave the office, the reverse happens, all that stuff. Uh, and then the other thing is I've been working on an app for Android Wear for like nine months now in my spare time, that spare time that I don't have, that I think might actually be the killer app hopefully at some <laughs> point. But it's all about like uh, basically every time you do a context switch, tapping on it to just verify and it saves the time, the date, where you are, all this stuff. And at the end of the day, you can actually go through and make actions. And then from there, you can get smarter and be like, hey, you were supposed to be at the gym 15 minutes ago. What are you doing? Like, that's <laughs> what my end goal is. I really want this to nag me more than anyone else on the planet can. I think taking context to the, to the next step, it's, it's, it's more about Android knowing, or the OS knowing about your patterns uh, throughout the day, the morning, evening, uh, uh, night. Uh, and I just feel like, should be able to wear my watch and wherever I'm walking, uh, work, home, all these connected devices know where I am and offering this type of information that I need at the moment that I need it um, in a very organic way. Like, I just imagine myself going into my home and if I was listening something on my car, just right away continue with the audio uh, when you enter your house or, or, or when you turn on your computer. Um, it seems like God, like, he knows where you are and he knows what you're doing. Uh, but I, I feel it's a cool, like, cool, cool idea. You should talk. I can make you that. Oh. <laughs> it's like we, uh, we already trust our phones, right? It already knows yeah, everything. Yeah, like, it may as well do useful things with that information. Yeah, like, on an exact note, like, mm -hmm. my shower has a Bluetooth speaker. And every morning when I, my music starts playing on my alarm clock, I go to my shower, the same music starts oh. playing. I leave, the same music plays on my phone, and so on. So we should it's a great life. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll say, so um, for Slack, I think um, kind of uh, understanding uh, context of, you know, where the user is communicating at that moment um, is going to be kind of big for us. Um, what devices they're using to communicate, um, how does that change when you're looking at a watch versus looking at a screen versus looking at a big screen um, or, or things like that. Um, and then also, uh, you know, with with the watch, uh, you know, how do we how do we make it so that you can interact with that in a way that makes sense? Um, that's kind of the other big part of it. Like, you know, a lot of these things are good at um, presenting information to you, but how do you make it so that it's easy to put uh, you know have input back into the system? Um, and I, I, one last thing is um, the augmented cardboard stuff. Um, it's still a little bit out, but I think there's there's got to be some cool stuff we can do with that. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Like those same challenges you describe. Like, okay, so there's the watch and the obvious use cases there, but how do you interact? It's exactly the same questions that we had like just a few years ago with phones first, and then again with tablets. It's like, all right, so it's useful. I have this thing here, but my web page is like 1024 by 768, and my phone screen is much much smaller. How do you present this information? How do you interact with it? What are the usage models? And it's, it's interesting to see that come up again now with different form factors. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, in the, we've got a few minutes left. So we've got some very pragmatic questions now. Um, what do you look for in an Android developer who would be joining your team? Um, let's see. So like any other developer, we're looking at just like speed, accuracy, all the usual, like, are you a good programmer? Um, but besides that, because the team is so small and we're often, like, fast moving, we really look for, like, follow through. Like, we want you to really care about something and see it all through, through to the end. And so, um, just, <laughs> excuse my language, number of shits given about your work, which you, yeah. Uh, so I have a bad answer for this, because I actually am a hiring manager, but I don't hire uh, Android only devs. Uh, nowhere in the company do we hire devs that are actually only doing one specific thing because we really like people able to do everything. Uh, and 
<laughs> yeah, I know, but he's happier now, I'm sure. Mm, he seems happy. No, but like the big thing is uh, we don't look for people that already know everything off the bat. We look for people that know something, and then uh, our CEO literally has a book on this called Smart and Gets Things Done. So I look for people who are smart and gets things done. Uh, and then piggybacking off your thing, uh, one of my friends, uh, John Lynn, is one of the heads of Startup Institute back in New York, and what he tells the st uh, students is what you want to be is you want to be the kind of person that you're working at a startup, you're, let's say you're a dev, and the office phone rings and it's 5.30 and office manager's gone, you shouldn't even have to think about picking up that phone, you just immediately go there and pick it up and say hi. And th like, that's the kind of people that I want and that's the kind of people that I hire. So if we were hiring right now, what, what, what would we be looking? Um, uh, solving problem, engineers. I think uh, the language is just one of the things that is least of uh, the importance. Uh, I think solving problems and being able to communicate uh, the problem, being able to communicate how to solve it, uh, to express whatever concerns you have uh, within the team. I think that's another item that is very important uh, that we're looking for. Uh, passion for building quality products um, and just the Android knowledge of we do look for like Android knowledge but it doesn't have to, to go so deep into the, the, the core it's more about what you have and how can you scale that and how can you build your own um, code as well. So one of the most important things is kind of the the enthusiasm that a person has for their craft and kind of their their it's their number of shits given. I like I haven't heard that one, but um, yeah, a, a similar idea. Um, just you know the passion to really want to make the best thing that you can make and um, really be excited about kind of you know the ecosystem, the products you're building, um, being aware of kind of things outside of your, your maybe your small um, area of expertise um, and thinking how you can bring kind of those outside things into your area of expertise. Um, and, and then when I'm you know, talking with people, when I'm interviewing people, um, sometimes you, know, you ask a very pointed question about, you know, yes, there is a right answer to this question. But the thing that I look for is, you know, do they think about the question in kind of the broader scope? How does how does that right answer fit into the system um, that they're building? Or what are the trade-offs? What are the types of things? I'm looking for people that are thinking kind of um, bigger than just a very specific thing. That makes a lot of sense. So it seems like across the board it's um, not specifically like this person knows Android really well, but it's this person understands bigger problems um, yeah, and then they can learn the language, right? So it's not like, hey, you need to have five years of Android in order to be successful. Uh, last question, um, quick one. Is your team hiring? <laughs> this this no. may impact the rest of your evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of Medium is hiring every team, so Android is no exception, so yes. My team's not hiring, which is awkward. Uh, but I've been told to tell you guys that my sister company, Trello, is hiring and they would love to talk to you. Uh, for this year, we're uh, done with hiring, so we're not hiring. Uh, we just acquired RDO and there's even like more engineers coming uh, with us, which we are super excited about. So that's it. So I was going to use hiring as my biggest Android challenge because it is. Um, and yes, we are hiring. Um, it's my number one priority. Fantastic. Um, so I, I, think, I think that wraps us up with time nicely. Do we uh, have time or opportunity for audience questions? Yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah. How do you do testing? I'll repeat them. How do you do testing for your products? Uh, I'm really big on testing. Uh, so I'm not big on unit testing, I'm really big on integration testing. And uh, I actually have written many posts about this. But uh, the big thing that I do is uh, we use the actual framework stuff, we use Robotium uh, for the actual somewhat of the, uh, the integration testing. Basically, Robotium gives me screenshot capability that nothing else gives me. And then Espresso for everything else. Uh, and I'm very, very big on owning the least number of Android devices that I can. To be fair, I believe I have 11 devices on my desk right now, <laughs> and two in my pockets right now. But uh, my big thing is remote testing. So uh, we used to use a company called AppStack, which got bought up by Amazon. It's now the Amazon Cloud Farm or something. 
Uh, and my secret trick with that is anytime someone reports a bug with a device that I don't own and I don't feel like owning, uh, I write an integration test to repeat their flow of what they said the bug was, and then I run it on that device and just record the screen the entire time, and then I try to find the solution and fix it, and then I can test it instead of going out and buying. I have five Samsung phones that were only sold in India, uh, and I don't ever want to buy another one of them. Yeah, so we, we actually um, kind of do a similar thing. We, we use a service called uh, Xamarin Test Cloud. So um, they have a warehouse somewhere that has all of these devices that we do not have to own. Uh, and we write tests for them, or we write tests that run against those devices. Um, and that's been, that's been really great. We don't, um, we don't have what we used to, would have had to have, which was that device library. And then you're constantly, is this? up to date, do I need to download Google Play services on this phone, but go back, yeah, so it's nice. So we have this uh, QA automation, we test, uh, uses API, Appium uh, to test iOS and Android, we have manual testing, uh, oh, shame on that, well, anyway. We have RoboElectric framework to test uh, integration testing, but we're moving, oh, we already started in Express, are you using Espresso? Uh, so we also want to do Espresso and now the pure JG unit uh, business logic and just take away RoboElectric. Yes. We're on the opposite camp of integration versus unit tests. <laughs> we write a crap ton of unit tests. Um, also on RoboElectric. Robo um, we also have a nice thing that's not really testing, but we have a Google Plus beta community, which is super, super great about reporting all sorts of stuff on weird devices and yeah. So that's kind of our unofficial test lab. And also Google now offers like cloud testing on lots of different devices and that's kind of our self reassurance that things are okay. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. I've, I've found that the, uh, the community of Android users are very helpful and forthcoming when you give them a beta and say, we know it's got problems, tell us what's wrong. If you just launch it when it's buggy, and then they'll also give you feedback, but less polite. Yeah. If you want to hear more about beta testing and how that's run, I actually literally gave an hour-long talk about this two weeks ago. So find me afterwards and we can talk all about that. Awesome. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes. Touched on this a little bit before in the, in the pair you came up. Um, and so mobile web versus native apps, I think, um, you know, I do have a little of that, little of that discussion with my was more iOS versus Android. I'm just wondering uh, how much uh, or what the strategy generally tends to be about your native web, mobile web capability versus the app and how you see that evolving going forward. And it seems like there's a lot of things you can do on native, but at the same time, it seems like uh, mobile web is also increasing its capabilities. So just wondering what you're thinking is about uh, Just to repeat very briefly for the live stream, uh, native versus web, discuss. <laughs> um, so we've well, Android didn't exist for a long time, so for a long time our Android users just had to live with mobile web. Um, our current policy is that the web client team does goes as far as they can while it's while still being like easy for them. And we basically say that if something is hard to do, just don't worry about it. When people ask, it's on the app. End of story. So that's kind of where we draw the line. Yeah, we kind of do something similar. Uh, the mobile web view is supposed to be the most optimized and minimal version of the website that you can get. So uh, the app has a lot of things in it, but sometimes I get bug reports that are like, hey, I'm on a low latency connection in the middle of like, I honestly had someone talk about, he was hiking in France and he had an inbox notification in my app and when he clicked it, the feed started loading and the inbox didn't load and he cared about all that. I'm like, just use the mobile website. Like that's what it's made for. Mm -hmm. And there are people who care a lot more than I do about making sure that's optimized. So that's that and then the, uh, the mobile app is the one that has all the extra niceties and whatnot. So in our case, we have a uh, web for desktop and we have uh, the Android and, and, and iOS apps. But we try to take this ecosystem. So we, there's not like super parity between the three products. But uh, when I'm saying about ecosystem is more that you are in the web and you're launching, launching the web in your phone and we have these URLs that, you're, that the Android application will take. Uh, we call them deep linking. Um, so we try to keep the, the loop between uh, web and, and mobile. Yeah, so we still believe that kind of the, the best experience that you know, an Android user, an iOS user, um, or even a Windows Phone user um, is going to get is going to be through a, a native app. 
Um, that might not always be the case. It, you know, JavaScript um, engines are getting better and faster and um, performance uh, on, on the native um, clients is getting better. Um, but at, at the moment, um, yeah, the best experience we can provide is on the, the native apps and trying to keep those kind of, um, you know, uh, in parity with, with the web app is, is a constant challenge just because they, they do have a faster release cycle. They're able, they, you know, our, our web team does continuous integration. So they're, you know, launching like what, 20 times a day, 30 times a day. Like, whereas we're like, our cadence is more like once every couple of weeks. So um, it's, it definitely creates challenges there. Uh, I just want to point out where we want. JavaScript on Android is a mess. Uh, Jeff Atwood, the co-founder of my company who now runs this course, just wrote a giant post about this. He found that uh, Android was, I believe, 11 times slower than iOS when it comes to JavaScript. And when you're trying to make a 60 frame per second really awesome app, uh, that's going to be ditched in the way of you. So a lot of times, I'm just not even worried about doing that kind of stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Any comment? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any words of wisdom? I thought the last stream that's a piece of advice for people who would be about to embark on this uh, immersive course. Learn by doing. Just mm -hmm. just go for it, and you'll probably write a bunch of stuff that you'll throw away, uh, but that means you're learning, so it's good. Uh, yeah, practice. Do whatever your interest is, your passion. Your passion will take you to build a product uh, faster because it's something that you want to achieve right away and see it. Physically, uh, and also uh, get involved in the community, uh, get involved in networking. Uh, you will learn a lot um, from other people. Uh, uh, even get men mentorship. Uh, it's really helpful uh, because one thing it's about learning about Android, but also like you need to know about the the overall experience of a software development cycle. So you will get that from other people that are already there. I do a lot of mentorship programs, so I actually have a canned response to this that I'm going to give you. It's uh, find something in your life that you're doing once a day, once a week, once a month, and automate it. And it doesn't matter if someone else already made an app that does it. It really doesn't matter if someone else already made an app that does it. Just make it for yourself. Uh, it doesn't, you don't even have to put it on the Play Store. Just open and source it on GitHub. Just make it. And then soon you'll be making more and more stuff, and then you're like, oh, I'm actually learning how to do this the correct way. Uh, and the most satisfying thing is always just when you have something that you're doing and then optimizing it and just making it something you don't have to worry about anymore. Yeah, I love all of these answers, just learn by doing. Um, one thing to keep in mind at the start, maybe for like the first month or so, is like don't beat yourself up for not understanding something like to the core. Like at the beginning, you're going to be overloaded with all, all sorts of stuff. So it's actually the right thing to do. Just kind of hedge your bets. Learn a little about this, a little about this. Get yourself to the goal, maybe a very short term goal. But keep yourself moving forward and like excited about it. And don't beat yourself up. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was going to say, right? It's like start, start coding as quickly as possible. As soon as you know enough to do the very first thing to make the screen look right, do that and then add the button and figure out what the button's supposed to do and how to make it work. I'm actually curious, was, is there anyone on the panel whose first experience on, on Android was like on a production app for someone else or did you each of you, how did you each get started? Was it hacking something on the weekend or um, straight into someone's production code? Mine was in production. Yeah. yeah. Straight into production. Yeah. So. Same. Yeah. I was making stuff that other people didn't already make. So I made a lot of apps that were just apps for websites, and then I got in a lot of trouble because I was scraping all of them. <laughs> but it was still just making stuff on my own. My first thing was um, I was doing research, and as part of the research, I needed just this like dummy app for my test subjects to use, and so it was this awful, ugly thing, um, but it was nobody else was looking at the code or the interface besides me and my test subjects. <laughs> Were you testing the interface? No, I was testing, <laughs> thankfully I wasn't testing the interface, so nobody was judging me. Um, you no, judging was judging your test subjects. So. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. All right, uh, question at the back. Yeah, well, I've answered this question as evasively as I can, so I guess I'll throw it to you guys. You know, what is Android in five years? What's the biggest difference between like now and five years from now? I, I have a crazy idea that maybe we'll get towards uh, some sort of continuous upgrade cycle, um, whereas uh, 
you know, instead of having these major releases over time, uh, it'll be more incremental, uh, smaller updates, and then uh, most of the uh, devices out there will be on the same API level. I wish more open source uh, Android OS and tools that we can contribute ourselves to improve uh, our tools for working. Um, and from, as a consumer, I will see Android almost everywhere. Like as I said, like God, uh, that they really know the, the user and what they need before us knowing what we want. So uh, I think it's no question that the next like five billion users uh, are going to be in different countries because everyone here already has smartphones. Uh, so the biggest thing that like you as an Android developer need to do that is uh, be really good at internationalization. Uh, you can't make UIs that uh, have hard coded widths and heights, and you have to make sure that you get put in, you know, German, and everything's like a hundred times more like wider. And you have to make sure that your apps still work on that kind of stuff. So it's uh, the Android ecosystem is going to get more and more diverse in the world that it's going into, I need to make sure that your apps can actually handle that. My first thought was that a few weeks ago, somebody told me that his brother was working on a blender that ran Android. Um, so I think that Android is just going to become much more of a household name. Like, of course, that's what this thing runs on. And I think that that's what I'm kind of feeling will be the biggest change. That we're not going to expect, oh, of course it runs on a phone. When I say Android, I mean the phone. No, when I say Android, I mean everything. Um, yeah. Great answer. Uh, yes. So I'm actually a UX design student here right now. And I'm just kind of curious on some tips, maybe on that side of things that you guys might have, and especially thoughts on how, um, as a designer, I can help or help hopefully help the user understand what they want to do and how they can So uh, tips for UX, particularly as Android moves beyond phones and tablets. So I think the biggest thing when you're doing UX for a specific uh, mobile device is to actually use that device. You don't want to be an iOS user who's designing for Android. Uh, and then, yeah, it's all going to be really different when you go into different stuff. Uh, material design is a good set of key guidelines for how to make all that stuff work out. And then the only good resource I can think of is uh, Chris Baines' blog is filled with all of the internals of how they decided to do some of the stuff they decided to do, and it's fascinating bedtime reading. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know I've seen people do this. Um, people make like material versions of various other apps as an exercise, mm -hmm. and they like maybe like um, put it out somewhere in the world and just get feedback on that. And so like there was a material version of Medium before we released their app. <laughs> that was kind of, I figured that was a useful exercise for the person who did it. I really get surprised when designers uh, switch back through devices. They use iOS and then they switch to Android. Um, and they really use uh, other type of uh, like TVs and, and they really experiment. Um, I really admire uh, those design designers because they, they get the ecosystem. They, they see how to bring the same experience with a different uh, design. Yeah, I think just using the, the various devices on a daily basis, um, using it kind of as your, your daily driver. Because um, you get the types of inter interactions where you know, you're know running to catch the bus, and you get a notification, and you want to like look it on your phone, but you only have one hand. And like you, know, you open the notification, and it opens on top of a different app. And then you hit the back button, and then it opens the previous app on the stack, right? So that's like an interaction that maybe somebody who hasn't really used an Android device wouldn't encounter or think about. So using the device, um, being familiar. Uh, I think those are all really good ideas. The, the other things which I would say is um, I like mocks. I was kind of getting to what you were saying, but like when you're actually trying to implement it, there's this context switch of like, I know what it looks like in my mind and it's going to take me like two or three hours to actually put it all together and make it look like that, by which point you've lost the agility. Um, whereas if it's like pieces of paper or whiteboards even better, you can just sort of iterate on how that may look and how it can work uh, without the overhead of putting it all together. Um, and in addition to that, get some see if someone can understand how to interact with whichever modality without explaining anything to them. Like, here's the watch. 
do it. And if they can, if they can't figure it out with you, you saying, "Well, this is how you do this, and this is how you do it," then it's it's already wrong, right? And that's especially the case for these emerging platforms, which there's no expected behavior. Like with phones, we kind of know now. In the early days, like the Android phones, my G1, ADP1, had a D-pad and a touch screen and a twirly knobby thingy. Because at that point, and the phone I had before that was a Sony, which had all of those things plus a stylus. Because no one knew, how were we going to interact with these things? Like it could be any of these things, and we don't know. We know now, it's basically touch screens. But how does that work with things like watches with blenders? Terrifying. Um, so yeah, like see how people actually do these things. How do they interact with it? Can they figure it out without guidance? I think it's really useful. And there's there's actually a lot of good tools that are coming out um, where you know designers can not need to write any code, uh, but they can create these kind of interactive mocks um, so that you can you know do this really early testing without having to do the kind of the heavyweight implementation. It's it's really cool. We've been using some of that at Slack. Google actually tried this uh, a few years ago. There was a Google tool that lets you make Android applications in like a GUI on your computer and then just run it. Uh, it's okay to do for the actual UI layer. Like there are things that let you do that. Uh, but when it comes to the actual technical side of integrating all that stuff, I don't think anything really good is gonna come in the future because it's just, it's not like modular stuff when they all work together. Everything is very customized and it's very intertwined. So it's very difficult to actually make something to just let you drag and drop and have it work. Yeah, you can make a, like an MVP and it'll kind of work. Um, but once you really need to start optimizing and you know, very specific use cases, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it, it would work. Maybe when we have uh, the singularity, what is it, 20 years? Something like that. Something like that, okay. Um, I think this harkens back to a point made earlier that lots of our apps look simple but are actually very, very complicated. Um, I think this is to that point. It looks like you could probably just like drag and drop and animate and things would be okay, but they probably, really, no, they wouldn't. I think that's the challenge, right? Because it's almost fine. It's like, yeah, look, it's working-ish. We just need to tweak it a little to optimize it, and that tweaking a little to optimize it will take much longer than it would have just been to do it from first principles and you know, hack around. Uh, let's see, one last question, if there's any one. I think we're all done. So uh, thank you very much, panel.